Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, uh, this lecture will be different from other lectures. We will talk less about the latest and greatest advances, although we will mention some of the greatest advances, uh, but more about commercial applications of superconductivity. And I'm working on these commercial applications for the last 25 years, first with uh, Intermagnetics General and then Philips Medical Systems and now with General Electric. So we have, I have a pretty broad understanding of what's going on with commercial magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, feel free to send me your questions. Here is my email address. Uh, uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Oops. So this is what we will be talking about. Uh, MRI marketplace, different types of uh, uh, MRI magnets, requirements to MRI, a few words about electromagnetic design, and then we'll see uh, time for uh, questions and answers. Okay, MRI is by far uh, the latest application uh, of superconductivity. Uh, so far about 50,000 uh, MRI scanners of different types are installed worldwide. Annual production is on the order of 4,000 scanners and about over three quarters of the installed base are superconducting scanners. We make about 100 million uh, MRI exams. Just to give you uh, an idea about the market, in the United States, we have one MRI scanner for 28,000 population. It is still uh, less than in Japan. Uh, there is one scanner per 21, 26,000, including non-superconducting scanners. And in European Union, depending on country, it's 61 MRI per 60 to 80,000. These numbers, by the way, explain why MRI in the United States is more expensive than in Europe. Because in the United States, MRI is waiting for you when you need it. In Europe, sometimes, or in Canada, you have to wait. Uh, and uh, uh, because there are fewer scanners. Still, this, you need to pay for the scanner, you need to pay for a technician. What we see in the late last years, uh, an increase uh, of MRI cells in developing countries, including high-end superconducting scanners. If you ask me what is the major challenge, well, there is a clear price uh, uh, limitation on the installed scanners. The scanner must, cost, must be below $3 million. Otherwise, customers will not buy it. This is, by the way, a significant driver for whether we can use or not HTS conductor in uh, MRI. Uh, superconducting magnets for MRI. Alternatives are resistive and permanent magnets. Uh, the first systems were resistive magnets, 0 0.5, 0 0.15 Tesla, introduced by a company called Foner. It's uh, in uh, New York State. This company still exists and still makes uh, uh, resistive scanners. Advantages of superconducting uh, uh, scanners are high uh, image quality because we can achieve significantly higher, factor of three higher field. It's the only configuration where we can really see uh, the tiniest um, uh, points in human body. The resolution is uh, no less than two millimeters uh, it's the shortest scan time, the highest throughput of patients. Uh, we can limit uh, magnetic field outside of the scan room. It's lowest weight system and competitive life cycle cost. Obviously, uh, uh, there are disadvantages. It's the highest purchased cost and pretty high installation cost. Uh, expensive service contracts. Uh, we, uh, most MRI, operate in persistent mode, we never turn field off uh, on one side. And of course, liquid helium. Quench, also it happens. Uh, although the greatest majority of MRI never see a quench uh, in hospitals. MRI makes uh, superconductivity and uh, uh, the, as the largest customer of helium. This is what you see in the United States. Uh, 
we in the United States use about 30% of all helium, while worldwide we use 20%. Why is that? Why we use more helium in the United States? Well, because about two thirds of uh, superconducting MRI are made in the United States and filled initially uh, with helium here. But you see, uh, this means that uh, whatever we MRI industry need to pay for development of helium production. We use uh, uh, in cryogenics about 50 uh, cubic kilometers of helium per year. The latest achievements are about 20 years ago, we introduced so-called zero boil off or uh, uh, better uh, zero helium loss systems where helium usage was reduced by about 75%. And most MRI scanners don't require helium refill while they are installed in a singles on one side. And the latest achievement, uh, it's first uh, Philips, uh, uh, they introduced their blue seal technology no liquid helium or very small amount of liquid helium, seven liters of liquid helium only for their systems. And uh, uh, what happens with helium? Actually, the demand of helium is insufficient. When we in MRI use most of helium or significant portion of helium, if we have more customers, uh, cost will be higher. And what we see now, by multiple reasons, we expect higher uh, helium price and reduced availability. Now let's talk about different types of MRI. Uh, and now let's start with magnetic field. And uh, uh, the message is higher field is not necessarily better for patient. You need to have a proper field for each um, four uh, images. Uh, he, he, this chart shows approximately what we are talking about. For uh, when we need the highest resolution, for example, brain imaging, we prefer higher field, three Tesla. Muscular skeleton, sometimes also better. But oncology and especially cardio is good enough for lower field, in our case, 1.5 Tesla. So what is the high field advantage? We can see uh, uh, very small abnormalities. It's higher to uh, signal to noise ratio, higher scanning speed. But obviously you have to pay the price for higher, uh, for higher field. It's higher cost, uh, sometimes smaller uh, field of view, uh, high, definitely higher stray magnetic field. We need stronger gradient coils, special scan protocols, uh, and patient discomfort. So most of the sites have a combination of uh, three Tesla, and 1.5 Tesla scanners, those are uh, standard commercial scanners, about uh, one three Tesla scanner per three 1.5 Tesla scanners. This is a brief history on field strength. Uh, the first uh, MRI, uh, superconducting MRI, uh, generated a field of just 0.5 Tesla. Pretty soon we found that the cost of 1.5 Tesla scanner is about the same as uh, 0.5 and 1 Tesla. So uh, the production of uh, lower field superconducting scanners practically stopped. Today, 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla constitute well over 95% uh, of the superconducting MRI magnets. And 1.5 Tesla is the best compromise between cost and performance. Just one number uh, published by Harvard Medical School uh, that uh, a typical 1.5 Tesla scanner, scanner, not magnet, installed is $800,000. When you see just a magnet, and if you say, look, we need to build a design and build a magnet like a MRI magnet, it will cost well over $800,000. Uh, at some time, we had an idea about so-called open configurations. Uh, we will discuss them later, but they are practically discontinued. There is a relatively small fraction of ultra-high field scanners, uh, 7 Tesla to 11.7 .7 Tesla magnets, but these are limited to research clinics. Only about 70 to 80 units delivered worldwide. So this is the picture how field strength changed. Uh, 
for the first 20 years of uh, MRI industry, we're going up and up and up in field, but now the situation is practically stabilized. We have a standard 1.5 Tesla and three Tesla scanners. We do not see commercialization of higher field scanners. Seven Tesla. It's uh, one of the greatest achievements uh, in superconductivity industry. Just, just think a little bit. Niobium, titanium, reliable, seven Tesla, and what you have a field on conductor there, it's close to eight Tesla, if not higher. Uh, uh, they are produced initially. It was Magnix uh, Scientific that started production. Then this company was a part of General Electric, then uh, Varian, Agilent. Now they are produced by Tesla Engineering in England and Siemens. Uh, uh, I think Tesla Engineering is uh, in, uh, in southern part of England and Siemens is Oxfordshire, Siemens Medical Systems. System integration, it's Siemens, uh, General Electric and Philips. The greatest advantage is excellent image quality. Special resolution is on the order of uh, half millimeter. But the magnets are very heavy, very expensive, very high stray field. Uh, so even in shielded magnets, they're about seven meters uh, from uh, the magnet, we still uh, have a restricted access area. Uh, this uh, requires additional very uh, heavy iron shielding that may be on the order of 800 tons that limits uh, for possible installation. Length of DC systems, it's about three meters energy over 70 megajoules, weight of the magnet is over 25 tons. Eleven point seven Tesla is old MRI system is the latest advance. We reached eleven point seven Tesla in niobium titanium magnet. This magnet was built uh, in uh, by designed by CA uh, uh, in France and built in Alstom uh, in Belfort, France, which is now General Electric. The total budget of this project, it's not about magnet alone, was over 200 million euro, but it includes several installations. Here you see base for different magnets. And uh, about, half a, about a year ago, the magnet reached field. Still images uh, are not made yet. Uh, images are planned for the end, uh, end of this year, early next year. Just a few numbers. Uh, it's actively shielded stray field. It's about 13 meters from the magnet. 84 tons of niobium titanium conductor. And the diameter of this magnet is five meters. This is definitely a research magnet uh, for better understanding how uh, human brain works. I would like to be involved in this project. <laughs> okay, types of MRI magnets per shape. Over 90%, and today 99% of superconducting scanners uh, have traditional cylindrical shape. Uh, cylindrical shape, uh, cylind these cylindrical magnets are the simplest magnets to build, the cheapest magnets to build, but they have obvious disadvantages, some patient discomfort, claustrophobia, uh, the bore size is relatively small. We cannot uh, do here or have limited ability to do invasive procedures inside the scanner. But cost-wise, performance-wise, this is still the best compromise. This is another advantage of cylindrical scanners. They are built in uh, mobile configurations. Uh, and it's the, they can, this uh, mobile configurations, this is a 40 feet, 12 meters uh, trailer. And uh, uh, the magnet at field can be moved from one location to the other. And uh, we practically don't see quenches even due to vibration and so on. To me, this means that mobile configuration of super heavy complicated superconducting magnets as possible. Uh, I think Philips is the only company that makes mobile three Tesla configurations. 
Open magnets were introduced about 20 years ago. It started with General Electric, followed by Philips, um, then for a short time Siemens. But today, uh, it's only Hitachi that makes this 1.5 Tesla Oasis. Advantages, definitely open access. Advantage, ideally, is that we can do invasive procedures through this board. But it appears that cost and complexity didn't compensate advances to medical practices. So practically discontinued performance. O overall, about 1,000 uh, open scanners were produced. I will show now two more great technical achievements, but they, they didn't materialize in commercial success. This is one of them. Outstanding breakthrough 25 years ago, MRT, magnetic resonance therapy introduced by General Electric. This was 0.5 Tesla magnet, and the idea was that we can do surgery under control uh, of MRI. So the surgeon stays here and have access to human body, and on this screen, he sees exactly what's going on. Uh, probably this scanner was just ahead of time. Relatively few systems were produced. One is still in operation 25 years after it was delivered. And another, uh, it's a so-called specialty scanner for muscular skeleton, for, uh, um, uh, for foot imaging. Uh, also relatively small market. It appears that cost of whole body cylindrical scanner is about sim is similar as compared to cost of specialty system. So MRI is a cost-driven industry. Okay, let's talk about requirements. I put here some of the requirements and what we see it's commercial magnet is always a compromise, multiple con conflicting requirements. On one hand, customers want uh, high field, high strength, high uniformity, but they don't want to pay higher price. And as a result, we need to find what is the best compromise, what is exactly necessary uh, to customers. And the first requirement is definitely safety. And this is what we need to say. MRI scanners are safe if properly used and maintained. There are no long-term negative effects of, of MRI scanning have been reported. Uh, MRI scanners were used uh, for pregnant women, uh, infants, uh, newborns, elderly people, no long-term effect, no radiation. You can perform MRI without limitation uh, as many times as necessary. Uh, safety uh, hazards well compensated include static magnetic field. This is what most people are familiar with, and uh, let's put it this way. At certain sections of MRI magnet, uh, magnetic force, uh, force on magnetic object is about 100 times of the weight of the system. So if you have something that weighs one kilogram, uh, the magnetic force may be up to 100 kilograms. So no magnetic uh, objects in sky the scan, uh, scanning room. Short term biological effects caused, for example, by uh, body motion, uh, uh, Effects on implants, but now implants are made MRI compatible. Uh, time varying magnetic field, uh, we, we may see some peripheral uh, muscle simulation. Again, uh, it's because of changing magnetic flux. Uh, acoustic noise uh, caused not by magnet, but mainly by gradient coils. Uh, and our experience is as soon as we are able to reduce. Uh, the noise of MRI scanner, uh, 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 physicians want uh, to uh, increase strength of the gradients or strength of magnetic field. So they use noise reduction to, advance, to uh, better image quality and higher throughput. Not that much about uh, patient comfort. And the last but not least, contrast agents. Uh, we are trying to minimize the use of contrast agents. Here you see some effects. Again, uh, this is, uh, what you see is mainly effects uh, that uh, of janitors. Uh, janitors, when they clean the room, you don't feel magnetic field at all up to a certain point when it's too late. 
So no magnetic objects inside the scan room. Patient comfort and compactness. Uh, just a, a brief history. In early MRI, when customers wanted to give us MRI at any cost today, uh, the first scanners had of a patient bore of only 55 centimeters and long, uh, over two and a half meters long magnets. Then in the uh, 1990s, the industry introduced 60 centimeter standard patient bore and 160 to 170 centimeters long magnet with by far better patient comfort. In uh, mid-2000, uh, Siemens started uh, a revolution. Significantly shorter magnet, uh, some often at the expense of a uh, uh, smaller field of view. Field of view was reduced, but Siemens introduced uh, uh, electronic technology uh, to make a better um, image quality, even with smaller field of view. And since then, this 70 centimeters patient board became standard. This is what we have now. And this is what we expect. Economy 60 centimeter patient bore and premium 70 centimeter, centimeter uh, bore. This is the patient bore. Uh, and uh, uh, no performance compromise in terms of uh, gradient strength or uh, in terms of field uniformity or stray field. And white bore magnets are uh, uh, available, commercially available in hundreds of not thousands of units worldwide. Let's talk about what are requirements to MRI. Again, remember that the magnet is only a component of the system. The uniformity here uh, in the field of view, which is approximately 45 to 50 centimeter diameter in standard magnets, is 10 parts per million in the delivered system. How we achieve it? We use multi-coil configuration. Here it's a typical eight coil configuration. We may have more coils in long, in shorter magnets. Uh, and uh, um, we also use so-called shielded coils to compensate stray magnetic field. Field decay. Uh, there are two requirements. First of all, during scanning, uh, the uh, uh, field decay or field variability shall not be more than one part per billion. And long-term effect, it's one-tenth of ppm per hour on average, which means that standard uh, MRI magnets uh, lose no more than one-tenth of one percent field per year. This is a very strong requirement because this is, remember, the keyword is resonance. And uh, uh, components of the receiving coils are tuned such that if the resonance is outside of this plus minus uh, 500 percent per uh, percent, uh, what for one twentieth of one percent, uh, we will not catch the resonance. Few components of MRI, it's uh, uh, again main coils, backing coils are here, cryo cooler, this is the place for passive shimming, uh, shims that we will discuss a little later, and this is field of view. Shielding. There are two options. One is so-called active shielding. You will use superconducting coils uh, with uh, opposite direction. Initially, I thought when I learned about this active shielding, I thought it should be too expensive. It appears, however, that passive shielding or uh, iron installed either on the cryostat or uh, on the walls of the system is uh, way too expensive. We are talking uh, Passive shielding uh, is on the order of $100,000, depending on the magnet. Uh, and uh, very heavy, which uh, means limited uh, accessibility uh, uh, on higher floors. So all uh, commercial uh, MRI magnets today use active shielding with uh, shield coils in opposite direction. And we measure it with five Gauss line, Y5 Gauss, this is safe to any patient, even the spacemaker. So typical field uh, for uh, requirements is four meters 
in axial direction and two and a half meters in radial direction for 1.5 Tesla magnets and five by three meters for three Tesla magnets. In refrigeration, uh, we see a huge advantage. Uh, we started initial magnets uh, were nitrogen shielded. Helium boil off was about uh, 0.4 uh, cubic centimeters per hour. So refill period for once in four months. And in addition to that, we needed to, ref uh, to re replace uh, liquid nitrogen uh, once in two weeks. First, what we introduced is uh, GM cryo coolers, which dramatically reduced helium boil off and we get rid of um, uh, get rid of the nitrogen shield, replaced by electric refrigerator. Now all commercial MRI magnets are so-called zero boil-off magnets. Again, no helium boil-off, practically no helium refill, uh, but it is not guaranteed, uh, but let's say 90% of MRI magnets, installed MRI magnets, don't require refill while they're installed on one side. And the latest advantages. Uh, it's a blue seal uh, from Philips G Freelium technology, no low cryogen or no cryogen at all. Uh, Philips advertises that they have only seven liters of liquid helium uh, uh, in the system. And uh, so soon we expect a commercialization of this Freelium blue seal and G Freelium technology. But it is still not in volume production, but I know that uh, Philips land plant for volume production is being built here uh, close to where I live. So this table, and you have it in my presentation, have a summary of what are uh, the commercial MRI magnets, how they look like, what is their size and typical properties. Uh, let me put just what is in the box, what we need to know uh, for future analysis. Stored energy, 1.5 Tesla, two to four, megajoules uh, uh, and three Tesla eight to 15 megajoules depend on configuration. Pretty lightweight three to six tons magnet with helium for 1.5 Tesla and just over five tons for three Tesla. And I count the length of conductor in terms of ampere meters or kilo kilometers because then we don't include current. What is this number? This is a product of conductor lens multiplied by current density, uh, multiplied by operating current, or it's exactly the same, conductor volume multiplied by current density. We need, uh, and if we assume that, let's say, uh, the magnet operates at 500 amps, then we need 30 to 50 kilometers of conductor for 1.5 Tesla scanner. Okay, now let's talk about uh, electromagnetic design and uh, those are the most important factors that we need to know. What is MRI? MRI is price driven, including installation and life cycle cost. The price, this is what drives our, what is important to customer, uh, price, uh, what drives our design. When we select whatever, uh, we make any design decision, it is price driven. The second requirement, it's the highest reliability at customer sites, hospitals. Uh, any quench is not good. Uh, magnet damage is not acceptable. Uh, very, what we need is a very high field homogeneity, uh, multi-coil uh, configuration, precise coil positioning. We need also persistent operation of the system because we need a very high field stability and we need a minimized stray magnetic field. Uh, one line that I missed here, uh, we'll discuss it later. This is emergency rundown. What happens if a patient, what, by whatever reason, experiences pain or requires immediate attention? We need to ramp the magnet down immediately. The only way to ramp the magnet down immediately is to quench the magnet. Immediately means in less than 30 seconds. So we need to have the ability 
to ramp the magnet down immediately. So when somebody says, oh, you know, I invented a system that will keep the field forever, we don't need uh, quench protection, just think about immediate ramp down. How we will do it, requ uh, the medical requirement is less than 30 seconds. Okay, conductor selection. Uh, we prefer to use niobium titanium so far. Why niobium titanium? It meets all MRI conductor needs. Mature, manufacturing friendly, optimized for MRI, mechanically very strong, manufacturing friendly, available uh, uh, in long lens with guaranteed properties. Variability of properties is within few percent along uh, the billet. It's the lowest cost superconducting material. Uh, the typical cost of niobium titanium wire is on the order of $1 per uh, kiloamp meter. Obviously, uh, the disadvantage is uh, low operating temperature. Uh, for, we need to operate at 4K or below. Uh, refrigeration is challenging. Refrigeration is expensive, but it is only a small fraction of the scanner cost. We will not save much by going to higher temperature. And the second issue where we need society help, how to improve stability of uh, niobium titanium magnets. Just a few numbers of what MRI industry uses. We use about 3,000 to 5,000 tons a year of superconducting wire. And this includes copper. Uh, in terms of uh, Niobium titanium, let's say a number is on the order of 500 tons a year. Uh, we use about two thirds or three quarters of all niobium titanium conductor by weight and uh, more than 50% of niobium titanium alloy. The major source of uh, niobium comes is Brazil so-called Arasha mine in Brazil, where uh, two mines supply about 75% of uh, niobium uh, worldwide. And this is the picture in Arasha mine. You see it's just excavation. You don't go to mining. And this particular mine has enough niobium to supply for the next 400 years. No shortage of niobium. Another very important number. Annual production, this mine is over 50,000 tons, and superconducting industry uses only less than uh, 500 tons of niobium per year. Uh, most of this niobium goes to uh, strengthening of uh, stainless steel, say uh, all suspension bridges, all bridges, uh, complicated structures uh, use niobium dopants. Uh, until recently, uh, Vachang. Uh, it's uh, uh, Allegheny Technologies. Vachang in Albury, Oregon was the only company that made uh, niobium titanium alloy in commercial pro, uh, quantities. Uh, now it is joined by several companies in China, starting from uh, Western Superconducting Technology. Uh, it's a pretty uh, equipment intensive operation because the melting temperature of niobium is almost 2500 degrees Celsius. This furnace where niobium is made is used for niobium production is, let's say, 5% a year at best. So, and this is good because this means that we don't need to invest to improvement of performance. MRI wire, typically two types of wire are used, so-called wire and channel. So, this is copper and this is niobium uh, strand uh, with ratio here about one to one, copper to superconductor ratio about one to one. Uh, this conductor is good for uh, overall copper to superconductor ratio in the range from somewhere five to one to 20 to one. The alternative is so-called monolith conductor. It may be either round or rectangular. Uh, in this conductor, we can achieve significantly higher current density, but this is more expensive. So current density in coils with monolith conductor is higher. 
However, overall cost of the magnet is about the same. Either we use wiring channel or monolith conductor. Uh, we have to use, uh, with wiring channel, magnets are a little heavier. Um, no, they're more efficient with monolith conductor, uh, but uh, technologies might be advantageous uh, for wiring channel. It is often a selection of what is traditionally used most likely in this particular industry. Uh, this table, uh, we published this table first in Superconductor uh, Science and Technology. And uh, this table is a part of um, our presentation. For people who work on uh, HTS or MGB2 MRI, I think this table is helpful. This gives guidelines what is necessary for uh, MRI conductor. And let's say these are minimum requirements. Uh, we need to meet to make sure uh, that we meet all these requirements. Um, some of these parameters, some of these parameters, we are more or less satisfied, including critical current, average current density, mechanical properties need to be improved, uh, quench protection. Well, it's okay, but think about emergency rundown. And the last but not least requirement, this is what we need. We need 20 to 30 kilometers of conductor per magnet and pieces, most pieces might be, must be more than three kilometers long. Uh, for now, only magnesium diboride meets this requirement. And of course, cost. Um, here I put in this table uh, cost that may sound a little bit uh, optimistic for HTS conductor. But I finalize it not for uh, 77 Tesla cell field, which most we know cost of the most conductor, but at 4K for Tesla, this is where we need this conductor. And when we calculate it, uh, we have about $1 per kilometer for niobium titanium, tin, $5 to $8. Uh, HTS conductor, uh, is over $10 up to $20 per kilowatt meter at four Tesla for Kelvin. MGB2 is probably on the other $5. What does it mean? We need quantity in the number of kilowatt kilometers. And uh, today, if we say have say 15 kilometers, it's an operating current, let's say with margins and so on, at $1, conductor cost is $25,000. Here, uh, uh, the cost of conductor will be well over $100,000. I don't know how the industry will be able to afford more expensive conductor. And besides multiple technological challenges, what I highlight in red here is uh, major challenges in conductor. No, uh, and uh, let me list uh, what I mm, uh, consider very challenging. Uh, no damage after quench. Uh, high strength stiffness of conductor, uh, such that we can, we can withstand uh, high strain. Uh, and uh, um, small bending radius. Insulation, we need to develop reliable insulation technologies. Piece lens that is, and properties that are guaranteed over 100% of the lens. Uh, we in the industry prefer no uh, coil uh, processing after winding, uh, such as heat treatment. And multiple magnet design issues, emergency rundown is one of the functions that we need to think about, how to ramp the magnet fast. And uh, we need to address typical issues of what we have in screening currents, component interaction, uh, because uh, we cannot use tape. We need multi-filamentary conductor with twisted filaments. Otherwise, we induce eddy currents that will interfere with uh, high-frequency gradient coils. And many uh, other issues that we still need to address. Okay, now, uh, let's talk about coil shape. Uh, most magnets use so-called what we call layer-wound multi-coil configuration. Here I show 
how coil shape changes when we go from short, a longer magnet to shorter magnet. Uh, when uh, we just try to meet the same requirements, but make the magnet shorter and shorter and shorter. And initially we start with six coil configuration, where one, uh, two coils are um, uh, shielding coils. This is this lens. We are more or less within the same uh, category, but you see how the shape of this coil changes from uh, uh, shallow coils, long and shallow coils, it becomes taller and taller, and the result is that magnetic field, peak magnetic field, increases from here to here and quite significantly. Although conductor lens remains about the same. See. Conductor cost it is increased, but not because of the amount of conductor. It is increased because of higher uh, peak field. When we make an ultra short magnet, <coughs> we have to use a 10 coil configuration or maybe larger. And the more coils, the more expensive production. So we are trying to find where is the best compromise for the customer needs and cost. Ultra high field magnets uses a different manufacturing technology. Remember that we used multi coil configuration. This is seven Tesla magnet designed from uh, Tesla, uh, Tesla uh, Magnex Tesla, and they use long solenoidal design with some coils uh, that compensate magnetic uh, field. Multi, uh, the, uh, there are additional coils here and here for shaping the field. Isolt magnet used completely different technology because of extremely high stored energy, 350 megajoules or so. Uh, they had to operate at very high currents and layer round appeared to be uh, not the best technology. So their coils, main coils are pancake wound and each pancake coil must be installed at a very specific position. Uh, this is probably the right decision, uh, the correct decision for the ultra high field 11.7 Tesla magnet, but it is not advantageous for commercial price driven uh, systems. But I show, I try to show you how uh, technology, how different technologies uh, uh, may work here. Field stability. Again, uh, we uh, the scanners require that uh, magnetic field is within one tenth of one percent of the nominal value. How we do it? There are two options. The first is driven operation. We have a highly precise dri driver or power supply uh, that is always connected. Mm. And the disadvantages of this configuration is high losses and current leads and uh, availability of these highly stable drivers. They are first very expensive and by far less stable than this requirement. So there are multiple techniques that are used to improve stability of the driver. One of them was used by Isolt magnet. We, all commercial, standard commercial magnets operate in so-called persistent mode. So we ramp the magnet and then we disconnect, remove, completely remove current leads and the magnet is in persistent mode. In order to do this, we need to use superconducting switch here, which is open. It's a thermal switch, which is open when the ramp the magnet and which is closed uh, when uh, the magnet is in operation. Advantages are, we don't even need a driver. Uh, actually, our service technician comes with a driver. So MRIs are not equipped with drivers. Uh, but the um, challenge for us, for superconductivity industry, we need very low resistance of this circuit. Let us estimate what should be the resistance of this circuit in order to deliver uh, the required uniformity. The total uh, resistance of the circuit should be less than one nano ohm total. One nano ohm. 10 to minus nine. Just compare, uh, if we make just a good uh, copper to copper joint, it's the resistance is 10 to minus eight. Uh, in a sense, we say that we can make 
we can make disadjoints reliably. All MRI magnets have disadjoints, and we don't even test disadjoints in routine performance. I would say we do better than we can even measure. We don't know what is the exact resistance. We achieved fantastic performance. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, it's um, a long-term development. There are two techniques. Uh, the idea is uh, we etch uh, copper from here uh, and uh, then twist filaments together and uh, either crimp them or use superconducting solder. Both technologies have advantages and disadvantages, but uh, the industry achieved very reliable performance of superconducting joints. We have to think what we have to think about this. Uh, uh, we need to minimize field on joints, uh, take into account field orientation, and develop very good production technology that ordinary technicians could make. Another uh, know-how is uh, the switch. Uh, and the switch, the advantages are the switch resistance. What we want is a minimum uh, losses during cramp. The switch is the highest source of losses during cramping of the magnet. So we want the switch resistance as high as possible when uh, we ramp the magnet. But we don't want uh, the way to do it is basically make it larger. But it's very difficult uh, and uh, expensive. So we try to find the best compromise. So we need to find it, minimize inductance. So make it by filer. Uh, very difficult, uh, make it reliable on off no spontaneous quenches in the switches, all this know-how, uh, but the industry was able to address, to make this, them, uh, this switches in a very, to make, to make them very reliable in large volume production. We are almost done. Uh, quench protection, again, those uh, magnets are installed in hospitals. Safety risk, magnet damage are unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. So this means that after quench, we should be able to ramp the magnet, uh, to cool down, ramp the magnet up again, and be ready for operation and do it within a few days. Uh, quench protection must not be expensive. Uh, and uh, uh, quench protection must work in all possible currents. Uh, in in multi-coil configuration, it's not that easy. Uh, we need to be able to detect quench and activate quench in all coils, even at all currents. Uh, at the same time, uh, high energy, high current density make it challenging. What we cannot afford? External dump. Because external dump uh, requires a high voltage across current leads. It's not how MRI magnets are designed. It's not compatible with um, emergency rundown. So we have to uh, uh, dis uh, dispose all energy inside the cryostat. So how we do it? Uh, passive detection, no operator involved. And in typical MRI magnet, we need to ramp the magnet down within at nominal current within, uh, let's say, one to three seconds. Uh, we uh, quench protection includes the following: uh, its detection uh, when we detect that the magnet happens, and typically we use one way or the other is compared to two halves of the magnet with and compare uh, voltages in this half says the difference is uh, significant, uh, sufficient, we activate quench protection. There may be more sections than two uh, for faster protection, but uh, more sections is more expensive. Uh, typically, we require that all, all coils quench uh, during protection. And shimming. When we build this complicated magnet, we can achieve uniformity in magnet as built about 500 parts per million. And uh, we need to design it uh, to uh, 10, to improve uh, shimming to 10 parts per million. 
couple of methods are used, so-called passive shielding. It's precisely positioned shim coils located here, uh, uh, sh sh uh, super, uh, superconducting shim located here, and passive shims are located here. This is the place for this is small pieces of iron, and uh, it's exactly what we do. And here you have a picture how shims are installed in real magnet. Shims are on rails, and technicians install them. This is the low, by far the lowest cost option, but the disadvantage is this is good only for specified field and specified location only. Uh, and when we move the magnet, we need to reshim the magnet and it requires uh, uh, a certified technician. It cannot be done by uh, service personnel. Hospitals like active sh superconducting shimming, uh, where uh, they use superconducting coils, small superconducting coils located here, uh, to improve the magnet uniformity. They, uh, physicians have, or especially research, uh, research physicians have better capability to control field uniformity. But it is definitely significantly higher call. Uh, and uh, uh, there are multiple issues to be addressed including interaction with the magnet components, in, in particular gradient coils. Sometimes we also use so-called resistive shims, uh, when, especially for brain imaging, when uh, these resistive shims are installed here inside the gradient coils. Uh, we just improve, improve uniformity in a specific uh, location, uh, such as nose. Uh, this is an automated procedure. So multiple techniques are possible. Let's try to find the best compromise. So in conclusion, this is what you need to take home. Uh, commercial MRI magnets reached maturity. We have uh, efficient, well-integrated magnet design. Still, uh, there are opportunities for improvement and growth. Superconducting MRI scanners are the largest commercial application of superconductivity. They dominate the marketplace and uh, offer the uh, highest performance and compatible life cycle cost. Niobium titanium is the conductor of choice for MRI industry. I put uh, some literature for further reading and thank you very much for listening. We did it in 50 minutes, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I hope everybody can hear me now. Yes, I think I'm unmuted. Thanks for that great clear talk, Michael. Um, are there any 